Uh, so Professor Heidi K. Brown is a graduate of the University of Virginia School of Law. She's a law professor at Brooklyn Law School and a former litigator in the construction industry. She served as of counsel with Moore and Lee LLP, a boutique litigation firm with offices in Washington, D.C. Uh, and New York City, where she handled all aspects of litigation uh, and arbitration of complex construction contracts and building development disputes. Uh, previously, she was an associate at the Manhattan firm of Thatcher, Profit, and Wood, and the Washington, D.C. area firm of Watt, Teeter, Hoffer, and Fitzgerald, LLP. Um, Professor Brown is the author of Untangling Fear in Lawyering, a four-step journey toward powerful advocacy, The Introverted Lawyer, a seven-step journey toward authentically empowered advocacy, and a two-volume legal writing book series entitled The Mindful Legal Writer. Professor Brown champions the importance of openly discussing stressors, anxieties, and fears in lawyering, and helping quiet and anxious law students and lawyers become profoundly effective advocates in their authentic voices. So welcome, Professor Heidi Brown. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here today. Yes, as the introduction mentioned, I was a construction lawyer for almost two decades, and now I'm a law professor, happily, in New York at Brooklyn Law School. And I'd first like to just say, while we're on the topic of being screen healthy, happy World Mental Health Day. It's a good day for us to take a moment and think about our intellectual, emotional, mental, and physical health as lawyers. So I'm a law professor and I like agendas. So I'm just gonna explain the agenda for the next uh, short time that we'll be together. So today we're gonna focus on how to be screen healthy lawyers or consciously connected a phrase I borrowed from Gwyneth Paltrow when she and singer Chris Martin described their amicable divorce as getting, quote, consciously uncoupled. We all know that our smartphones, our iPads, our laptops, and our other screens afford us 24-7 connectivity on planes, trains, even on vacation. As expert multitaskers, we tend to click through multiple email accounts, social media platforms, and favorite apps at lightning speed, countless times a day and night. But the way we engage with these ever-heightening levels of connectivity and nonstop stimuli can undercut our intellectual productivity and impact our mental and physical well-being. So today we're gonna delve a little bit into the science underlying our relationships with our many screens. I'll start by providing some background statistics on screen use. And then we'll talk about the impact of this hyperconnectivity on lawyering. We'll chat about some ethical duties related to technology. We'll discuss some of the not so great effects that the technology at our fingertips has on our productivity and our mental and physical health. But focusing on the positive, we'll round out today's discussion with some advice from the experts and some solutions. Reframing our relationships with our screens, we can be both responsive and healthy legal communicators. So I wanted to start with a little anecdote. So Madonna, the pop star, recently launched a tour of small venues, starting in Brooklyn, New York, where I live. Any Madonna fans in the room? Okay. So, my best friend was turning 50 on opening night of Madonna's tour, so we bought tickets. We had to take out a small loan to do so, but we bought tickets. And then, a couple weeks later, we received the scariest email of all time from Ticketmaster. Quote, this concert will be a phone-free experience. As in, no cell phones, no photos, no selfies, no bragging rights on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. Now this sparked, this email that we all got from Ticketmaster sparked fear, panic, and dare I say anger in our phone-addicted New Yorkers. It also ignited a bit of irony as well. Madonna reportedly was on her iPad during the Broadway show of Hamilton. So we thought this was a tad ironic that she was outlawing phones. But anyway, our desire to see Madonna in the same venue where my law students actually graduate from law school, we host our law school graduation in the Brooklyn Academy of Music, and Madonna was gonna play there, so our desire to see her in this small venue overshadowed our collective chagrin at not being able to watch the whole show through our, our phone cameras and brag about it on social media. 
So my friend and I arrived at the venue, and we dutifully went through the line and placed our phones in these sealed pouches. It actually didn't take as long as I thought it was going to. Then a remarkable thing happened. We actually talked to each other. We met strangers. We shared prior concert experiences for the two hours that Madonna made us wait before she went on stage. When Madonna came on stage at 11 p.m., yes, I almost died of exhaustion, for the next two hours, we could actually see the spark in her eyes, the expressions, the facial expressions on her dancers' faces. It was honestly remarkable. It was a remarkable experience. But another remarkable realization I had during the show was how many times I instinctively reached for my phone. And I couldn't use it, obviously, but I found myself every 10 minutes or so going to grab my phone to take a picture, to do something with my phone, just to check it. So I thought I'd mention that just because today's point is to realize how much we actually use our screens and how that's a good thing to a point in our profession, our hyper-connected profession, but how sometimes it's good for us to take a step back and realize if we do so in an unhealthy way. So I thought I'd ask a couple prompts, and, and you don't have to admit any of the, the answers to these questions aloud, but I thought I'd pose a few questions and just have you think for a moment. So, sitting here right now, think about how many devices do you gaze at or stare at or check each day? Do some of you have more than one cell phone? Do you use a laptop? Do you use a desktop? Do you have an iPad? Do you read books on a Kindle? Do you watch television at night? Now, how many times per hour do you think you check your smartphone? When you do check your smartphone, how many apps do you access each time you check it? I'll admit to you, I tested this out earlier today. When I check my phone, which I do constantly, I look at my text messages. I, if I'm traveling, I check the weather. I check the weather in New York. I check the weather here in San Francisco. I check the weather on my next vacation destination every time I look at my phone. I check to see if I have any notifications on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I then scan Google News. I then scan Apple News, which is usually depressing. I then check LinkedIn. I newly have started checking something called Slack, which I just have come to know as a, as a team communication app. So that's nine sources of information that I click through in like 30 to 60 seconds every single time I check my phone which I did not realize until I was asked to come and do this talk today. Another question for you. How many email accounts do you have and check daily? You might have some, obviously you have them for work. <clears throat> you might also have a personal email account. How many smartphone and computer, quote, notifications do you receive a day? Do you hear little beeps, alerts, little dings? So just think, based on those questions that you may hopefully have answered a little bit in your head, how many ads, images, videos, texts, social media posts, etc., is our brain processing multiple times a day? It's like walking through, to use a New York reference, it's like walking through Times Square in New York City every time we look at our phones. A couple more questions, maybe a little uncomfortable questions. Is your smartphone in your bedroom when you sleep? Do you check your phone in the middle of the night? When you travel on planes or trains, do you access Wi-Fi? Mostly on planes, do you access Wi-Fi to stay connected during the flight? Do you feel very antsy when you cannot check your Wi-Fi in the middle of the flight? Again, do you read books on a Kindle or in hard copy? Do you look at a screen when you exercise? Do you bring your smartphone to the dinner table or to the lunch table? And then here's some questions some of us might want to know. Does your neck hurt? Did you, does anyone in here have neck pain? <laughs> I see a lot of craning of necks right now as I said that. Does your neck hurt after you stare at your phone for a little while? Do you often get dizzy when you put your phone down? Do you get dizzy or do, or do your eyes feel dry when you're staring at your phone for a while? So last question, are you on your phone right now? <laughs> or do you wish that you were? 
So I thought I'd start just by showing some background statistics on this so we can learn what, how this is affecting us as lawyers in doing a very important job for our society. So a helpful Texas Bar Journal article written by Chris Ritter, director of the Texas Lawyer Assistance Program, and I included this article in your packet of materials that'll be provided or maybe has been provided to you. So this helpful Texas Bar Journal article written by Chris Ritter provides the following statistics and reports. Americans sit behind desks and stare at screens for an average of 10 hours and 39 minutes a day. People are averaging 24 hours a week on the internet and three to four hours a day on our phones. Nokia conducted a study back in 2011 that found that the average person looks at his or her smartphone 150 times a day. 150 times a day we look at our phones. 58% of adults do not go one hour without checking their smartphones. 54% check it in bed. I am definitely guilty of that. 30% check it while dining with others. In 2014, adult Americans sent an average of 32 text messages per day. So overall, we're spending, if the math is correct, between 71 and 89 hours staring at our screens per week. Further, the magazine for the Institute of Industrial Engineers reports that the average office worker spends 1,700 hours per year in front of a computer screen. Liza Kindred, who's CEO of Mindful Technology, reports that 90% of Americans have their phones within reach 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So how does this affect us? Now, I'll try not to be too doom and gloomy throughout this talk, but this is interesting for us to just note, and then we'll move on to what we can do about it. How does this affect us? Well, it can cause us to be unnecessarily depressed. A 2010 study established a relationship between depression and text messaging and emailing. When it comes to multitasking, some reports indicate that multitasking can actually lead to depression. Let's talk about being sedentary. Our screen time also affects the number of minutes per day that we stand up and move around. Data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey shows that many desk workers accumulate approximately eight to nine hours of sedentary time per day. What about our eyes? The American Opt Optometric, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, Op Optometric Association indicates that between 64 and 90 percent of computer users experience visual symptoms which may include eye strain, headaches, ocular discomfort, dry eye and blurred vision. And since we're probably mostly or all lawyers in the room, how does this affect our productivity? This condition has a significant impact not only on visual discomfort, but also occupational productivity. So how does this hyperconnectivity hyper affect us as lawyers in our profession? Well, obviously our, our ability and our need to be connected 24-7 has changed our clients, our opposing counsels, and our law office manager's expectations in how we practice law. It has accelerated the pace of our practice. Because of the 24-7 accessibility that technology affords us, we have, and I mean all of us, lawyers, clients, opposing counsel, law office supervisors, junior attorneys as well, expect immediate responses. Supervising attorneys, I, I coach a lot of them in the law school world and supervising attorneys definitely expect immediate responses from junior attorneys. So we're expecting our new generation of lawyers to be connected 24 seven as well. An ABA survey showed that 58% of all lawyers texted their clients either regularly or occasionally in 2013. So a different Heidi, Heidi Barkus, wrote, in taking advantage of technology, she said, clients expect an immediate response. We practice in a time when many of us get our news from Twitter and Facebook. So there are fewer of us waiting around for a newspaper to arrive at the front door at 7 a.m. So even fewer will wait three days for a response from their lawyer. So this raises the question, are we multitasking with all of these screens? Are we, doing, are we multitasking well, or are we multi-slacking? 
So Jeffrey S. Krauss wrote an article called, Do You Sleep With Your Blackberry? This is from a couple, couple years ago. <laughs> and he wrote, multitasking is wonderful if you are truly accomplishing several things at once. On the other hand, it does little good if none of the tasks are completed. The unfortunate truth is that many users of mobile technology are more aptly described as multi-slackers. They are distracted from important tasks by nearly continuous rings and vibrations related to everything except the task at hand. That's no way to run a business, Krauss says, let alone a law practice. Although availability is a component of maintaining good client relationships, proper handling of cases is far more important. Our rapid response pace can affect substance and clarity, whether we mean it to or not. We might think we're doing a great job by responding to a client's or a supervisor's or an opposing counsel's question really quickly. We might think that we're meeting expectations, we're doing what's expected to us. Let's be quick, let's be on top, on top of it, let's be available. But as Sally Anderson, Vice President of Claims at Wisconsin Lawyers Mutual Insurance Company pointed out, it often takes some time to research and think before opining on a legal matter. We know that deep down. The law is complicated. The right substantive answers and procedural steps are not always obvious. As Jennifer Rose points out in her article, Email in the Law Office, clients often expect quick answers to their questions, not realizing that fast can mean sloppy and that no lawyer can know all of the law. No lawyer can possibly know all of the law. It's okay for us to take time and explain that we need time to answer complicated questions about the substance that we deal with every day and complicated procedural steps that we need to take. Now we all know this, but it's probably important to say out loud, technology can affect our tone too. We all know that the speed and the ability to communicate without being face to face, conveniences that technology does provide us, contributes to changes in our tone. Now, some of us might have been accused of being non-responsive if we take a few hours, or God forbid, a day or two, to respond to somebody else's urgent, urgent email. And as Lele Wang Ekval, an attorney in Orange County, noted, the formality and thoughtfulness that are commonly associated with a letter are rarely seen in an email nowadays. When a situation becomes adversarial, the informality of email allows the parties to feel more comfortable using rude, curt, or inappropriate language. And I can attest that this still happens in law schools in addition to the legal profession. Important legal interpretations and agreements that we put in email might be lost in translation or misinterpreted over email because of tone or just the language that we choose or we fire off quickly in, a, in an email that we're doing on the go. What we gain in speed and communications, we might sometimes lose in civility. Our rapid fire responses, or the expectation of them, could have ethical consequences too. The Wisconsin Lawyers Mutual Insurance Company reports that communication mistakes account for 25% of malpractice claims. So we might consider a few types of communication missteps when we're trying to do things really quickly or the expectation to do things quickly starts to weigh in. If we fail to communicate, will a client be upset that we haven't communicated fast enough? Or a supervising attorney might be annoyed that we haven't responded fast enough. What if we do respond quickly, but our two quick communications provide erroneous legal advice? Or we might have all either been the victim of or the perpetrator of the cringeworthy reply all. How many of us have accidentally fired off a text to the wrong person because we have too many texts going at the same time? Now, one resource that I read while preparing for today called this possibly a badge of honor mindset. And this, this is important for us to just take a moment to think about. Some experts have questioned, by having this 24-7 connectivity, are we fostering or furthering this badge of honor mentality? So an author named Molly Peckman wrote an article called When Life Was Simple, Blackberries Were Fruit. She noted, at a recent reunion with colleagues from a former firm, 
We compared our toys, and we bragged about getting emails at all hours of the night. So I thought we'd take a, just a brief moment and talk a little bit about ethics rules and compare three rules related to communications. So the model rule of professional conduct 1.1, which talks about competence, has a comment eight. And comment eight states, to maintain the requisite knowledge and skill, a lawyer should keep abreast of changes in the law and its practice. And here's the part I wanted to emphasize, including the benefits and risks associated with relevant technology. So this is cool, actually. I think this is kind of neat. The model rule, at least, is prompting us to consider the risks associated with relevant technology. Now, this probably means the risks of inadvertent disclosure of privileged communications and other potential pitfalls from, from technology. But I suggest that we also consider the risks to our mental and physical health, which can affect our competence as lawyers. Now, I know California has its own set of rules, and California does not include that language in the comments to its Rule 1.1, the language about including the benefits and risks associated with relevant technology. But regarding timeliness of communications, California Rule 1.4A3, which talks about communication with clients, states that a lawyer shall keep the client reasonably informed about significant developments relating to the representation, including promptly complying with, again, reasonable requests for information and copies of significant documents when necessary to keep the client so informed. So that's a long mouthful of, of rule there. But when you look at California Rule 1.0.1H, which involves terminology, they just define reasonable or reasonably as the conduct of a reasonably prudent and competent lawyer. It's defining the, the word with the actual word. So let's, being a New Yorker, I wanted to show you a comparable rule in New York, but with some language that might help us a little bit break down how we can be healthy and responsive communicators. So I looked at Rule 1.4. So we had just looked at 1.4 in California. I looked at Rule 1.4 in New York, which also talks about communication. And this rule, in my interpretation, gives lawyers a little bit of leeway to sort of rein in the timing, that expectation of rapid-fire timing of communications. So like California's rule, New York Rule 1.4A4 states a lawyer shall promptly comply with a client's reasonable request for information. But comment four to the rule elaborates. And I, I kind of like this elaboration. When a client makes a reasonable request for information, paragraph A4 requires prompt compliance with the request. But here's, here's a, a caveat. If a prompt response is not feasible, so we can interpret what feasible means, but if a prompt response is not feasible, the lawyer or a member of the lawyer's staff can acknowledge receipt of the request and advise the client when a response may be expected. Now, that might be a little weird to think about, but just acknowledging the client's re request and then saying, we, we hear you, we're going to get back to you, New York says that that's possible. A lawyer then should promptly respond to or acknowledge client communications or arrange for an appropriate person who works with the lawyer to do so. So to me, this is almost like when we're standing at the in the line at Starbucks, or we're sitting down at a table in a restaurant, or we're trying to purchase something in a store. Sometimes all we want is for someone to just say, I see you, I'll be right with you. And this is, this is a, a simple way to say, yes, I received your communication, I'm on it, I need some time to process it, I need some time to research the proper answer, but I see you, I hear you, and I will get back to you. So even though we may feel this immense pressure to be hyper-connected as lawyers, and some of us honestly may enjoy that, we might enjoy being always the go-to person, or being on call, or being responsive. We might actually get some enjoyment or satisfaction or fulfillment out of that, and that's okay. But even though we feel this pressure, we may enjoy it, it's important for us today to think about what is the effect of our screens, just the, even the physical act of staring at them for those many hours a day, 
And, and what is the effect of our hyperconnectivity on our real productivity and our mental health and our physical health? So I'll first focus on mental health. Do we have a fear of missing out? Or as I typed in FOMO in my computer, I, it actually first wrote F-O-M-U, and I thought, do we have a fear of messing up? Do we feel we have to respond in incredibly quickly because we are afraid that if we don't, that we're somehow messing up? So Susan DeSantis, who's a journalist for the New York Law Journal, wrote a great article in April of this past year, 2019, called Lawyers and Experts Fear Dire Consequences at the, as, sorry, let me start that over. Lawyers and Experts Fear Dire Consequences as the Pace of Legal Work Accelerates. And she quotes Paula Davis Lack as saying, the culture is, I'm going to miss out on something if I don't check my phone every 10 minutes. We've made it so everything is a fire drill, and so we're on all the time, and that just creates a ton of stress. So remember the term crackberry. Molly Peckman, who wrote the article I mentioned earlier, when life was simple, blackberries were fruit, reports, in fact, the technology, the technology itself, of reading and sending simultaneous emails is habit-forming, hence the nickname crackberry, in moderation, it can be a fantastic tool for lawyers, as long as we learn to put it down once in a while. So Caroline Spiezio, who wrote an article called Constantly on Call, the client's role in the legal profession's mental health crisis, reports that even our client's demands for fast turnaround time, even on non-urgent matters, can leave outside counsel in what she calls constant crisis mode because we do feel and we want to be responsive, but it can cause a feeling in the lawyer or in the junior attorney or even opposing counsel, whomever the response is expected from, to feel in a constant state of crisis. So Brie Buchanan, co-chair of the National Task Force on Lawyer Wellbeing, also cautions that in-house departments that she, she says run their counsel into the ground are honestly not gonna get the quality of the work that they want and that everyone feels that clients deserve. So how do, how do screens also affect our creativity? As lawyers, everyone in this room is trying to creatively solve problems. Sometimes the solutions to our legal problems are not right there in the lengthy contract or the statutes or the cases that we read on a daily basis. Sometimes we have to be creative and come up with non-legal solutions to legal problems. Are screens affecting our creativity? Do our screens make us less creative as problem solvers? So Dr. Victoria Dunkley writes about the effects of screens on kids. So that could be a different science than the effect of screens on us. But this doctor says, in analyzing the effect of screens on, on kids' creativity, she says, screen time stunts imaginary play. When the brain is fed a constant stream of stimulating entertainment that saturates our senses, it deadens the creative drive, as does viewing a 2D screen with flat, unnatural light. And I'm going get to get to the light of our screens in a little bit. But just that point about creativity, as a law professor, I'm constantly trying to educate our future generation of lawyers that being a lawyer is a creative act. We, we sometimes have to think outside the box, think of creative solutions to non-obvious problems. And it, it's shocking to realize that our addiction to our screens might be stunting or hindering our brains to be creative in problem solving. So let's talk about social media for just a moment. Of course, social media can be a great source of information for us as lawyers. We do, a lot of us do check Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn for the news and to find out what's going on in our profession. Those social media platforms can also help us build our brands. It can also help us vent, vent about things when we need to. But let's take a closer look. So in 2017, Harvard Business Review published an article that reported that the average Facebook user spends almost an hour on the site every day. Then a Deloitte survey indicated that for many smartphone users, Checking social media apps is the first thing they do in the morning, often even before getting out of bed. And a more recent survey 
published said that while real world social networks were positively associated with overall well being, so real world actually sitting in the room like we're doing right now, those types of social interactions are positively associated with overall well being. However, the use of Facebook was negatively associated with overall well being. And the quote was, exposure to the carefully curated images from others' lives leads to negative self-comparison. So those are just some summaries of perhaps the mental health effects. And in a moment, I'll start to talk about what we can do about that. But first, let's talk about the physical effects of our relationships with our screens. So does anyone in this room, I asked this earlier, experience neck pain? Are you experiencing neck pain right now? An article from UC Berkeley describes how using a tablet computer can be a pain in the neck, literally. The phenomenon is so well recognized by doctors, it even has a name. They call it iPad neck, or gener generically, tablet neck. And that's true. I went to a, a chiropractor once in New York, and she said I had iPhone neck. It was a problem. And I, it happens, it hurts all the time. So this, I, I have up on the screen the 60 pound effect. Now how many of us want to walk around carrying 60 pounds more than we need to? But that's what we're doing. So according to the doctors and the experts, by keeping our neck flexed forward when we look at our phones, our screens, we're putting more load on the upper region of our spine. Now I'm not a doctor, I have zero medical training, but they say that we're putting more load on our upper region of our spine called the cervical spine. So according to a 2014 study in a publication called Surgical Technology International, computer modeling showed that when we flex our necks at a 45 degree angle, we put 49 pounds of pressure on our cervical spine. When we tilt our necks 60 degrees, the force is equivalent to 60 pounds. That's how much more pressure we're putting on our necks just by craning our, our necks to look at our phones. So our necks obviously support our heads, containing our vast, giant lawyer brains. But our head already makes up one-seventh of our total body weight. So just the way that we're using and interacting with our screens, we're doing it in a way that's putting so much pressure on our neck that's already holding up our heads. We're overloading and injuring the muscles in our necks, our shoulders, and our upper limbs. So even just engaging the way, if we do it unconsciously or not mindfully, the way we use our screens, we're creating physical pain in our bodies that just doesn't need to be there. And there are things that we can do about it, but until we realize that's what we're doing, we're gonna keep doing it. It's just habit, we're all used to it now. Another issue is laptop ergonomics. And I, I did not realize this until I started researching this. But according to the University of Michigan, laptop computers are just not ergonomically designed for prolonged use. The monitor and the keyboard are obviously so close together, you can see from this one on the stage, that it's impossible for both to be in good positions at the same time. So it's better for us to actually work from, and I'm a I always use my laptop, so I'm, I'm saying this to myself. It's better for us to use a separate monitor and a keyboard with both in the right uh, physical positions to help us sit in a, phys a physically healthy manner. I do everything wrong, okay? So I do my best work at home on my couch. I have written so many briefs at home on my couch. I have written two books at home on my couch. And this is how I sit with my laptop in the worst possible way. I sit on the left-hand side of my couch and I prop the laptop up on the left-hand armrest and I contort my entire body <laughs> towards it and I am typing with my neck craned and I am wound up like a pretzel for hours and hours and hours on end. That is horrible, but I continue, even knowing this research coming here today, that's how I worked on my laptop yesterday. It's a habit. And if we want to get better at this, we're gonna have to change some of our habits. Desk ergonomics, too. Now, apparently, I did not know this either, but most desks are built at the correct height for writing, handwriting, not for typing. And also, the way that a lot of our desks are situated, 
our screens are too far away from us, so it forces us to put this pressure on our necks. In researching for this talk today, I also learned a new term, texting thumb. There's such a thing as texting thumb. It actually has a syndrome name. It's called de Quervain syndrome. So our smartphones increase our risk for this syndrome, texting thumb, and it, we irritate the tendons or tendon sheath, the doctors call it, on the outside of our thumb, just by the way we naturally use our phones. And then the last depressing thing I'll mention to you before I get to some positives is that we experience eye strain and headaches as well. Because of the way we use our screens, many of us are susceptible to eye strain, dry eye, headaches, and insomnia. Do we have any sleep-deprived humans in this room? Okay. Experts say that th by focusing our eyes on computer screens without taking a break, it reduces the width the, how often we blink, so it reduces our blink rate by a third to a half, which can dry out our eyes. So I mentioned sleep deprivation, and I am definitely a sufferer of sleep deprivation. So I learned something incredibly eye-opening during this research for today, and if you take away only one thing from this talk today, maybe it could be this. If we are feeling sleep deprived, the cause could be the blue light from our screens. Because apparently, and I'm attributing this to Jake Swearingen, who wrote a, an article, apparently blue light is the gluten of the visible spectrum. I just thought that was a funny way to put this, but I did not even know the term blue light existed, but apparently it's very, very bad for us. And all of our screens have it. So here's how this works. And this is pure science and mind opening. So according to an author named Chris Hoffman, the lighting of the world around us changes according to the time of day. Now, now we, we know that. The light, there's sunlight, then there's not. So <laughs> during the day, though, we're exposed to bright sunlight that has a cool blue color temperature. It, that made no sense to me when I first read it, because when I think of the sun, I think of hot, things being hot. But apparently the light is a cool blue color. This helps us stay awake, it affects our circadian rhythms, it's a good thing during the day. So at night, though, the bright sunlight is gone, and we transition to using indoor lighting that is generally dimmer and warmer, apparently. So our brains secrete melatonin at night when we're not exposed to sunlight, and that's what causes us to get tired and fall asleep like normal humans are supposed to do. But our phones, our televisions, our computers, our iPads, our laptops, all emit this cool blue light, which makes us think that it's daytime, which then slows our melatonin production, and it messes with our sleep cycle. Now, according to Hoffman, staring at these bright, sun-like screens late into the night or in the wee hours of the morning, as many of us do, not only does it strain our eyes, but it inhibits our melatonin production. That is possibly why many of us, it takes us longer to fall asleep at night, or how many of us wake up a lot in the middle of the night. Anybody in here have that problem? I should start texting you in the middle of the night because I'm awake too. According to a Harvard Health letter, Blue light is helpful during the daylight hours because, again, it boosts our attention, it boosts our reaction times, we can think faster on our feet, it boosts our mood, maybe we should surround ourselves with blue light so we'd be in a good mood, but blue light is absolutely disruptive at night. It throws our body's biological clock off balance, our circadian rhythm, it throws it out of whack, and we don't sleep as well. And as lawyers or participants in the legal profession, in whatever capacity, this is a problem. We have to think clearly, and we're depriving ourselves of better sleep just by staring at our phones late into the evening. Now, why is this a problem? A lot of us are probably pretty highly functioning without sleep. We think we are, at least. We do it all the time. But a National Sleep Foundation survey reported that 90% of Americans are using light-emitting devices within an hour of going to sleep. 
and greater use in their surveys or their studies was associated with worse sleep outcomes at all ages. So why does this matter? So one study reported in a publication called PubMed, they did a study where they tested people with chronic restriction of sleep to six hours or less per night. Now, six hours to me sounds glorious right now, by the way. But they restricted people to six hours or less of sleep per night. And their study showed that it reduced cognitive performance deficits, sorry, it produ produced cognitive performance deficits equivalent to up to two nights of total sleep deprivation. So it's like going two nights with zero sleep. So what we're doing to ourselves by depriving ourselves of a good, solid, more than six hours of sleep is really having a profound effect on, on our, our uh, capacity to think clearly and perform at a high cognitive level. Okay, let's talk solutions. So now, after all this doom and gloom that I've put out there and, and all the, the negativity around our screens, let's talk advice and solutions. Let's become consciously connected. So especially on World Mental Health Day, I wanted to take a moment to talk about how we can be whole lawyers. So I know that notion might sound a little touchy-feely, but it's, it's really important. And if you're not familiar with the National Task Force on Lawyer Well-Being, the, the toolkit that they put together, um, it was prepared by Anne Brafford, and it's a ma an amazing resource. It's, I highly encourage you to check out this toolkit. It's about 80 pages long. And it's a fantastic resource, especially for law office managers or in-house counsel uh, departmental heads to, who want to put systems in place to help all employees, not, not just the lawyers or the paralegals, all, all staff. And let's not forget about all the staff as well. There's also a two-page nutshell and that's where I got part of this visual from on the left-hand side of the screen, the six dimensions of lawyer well-being. So when I speak to law students about these issues, some of them feel that talking about well-being or mental health or even physical health is too touchy-feely for law school and it might make them look weak. And so the way that I respond to that is to start to think about the concept of being a scholar-athlete. Now, when I was in college, I was not an athlete at all, and I was always envious of the term scholar-athletes. I just thought that was a really cool term. And I've started to think about us in the legal profession as scholar-athletes. We can't just only focus on our intellectual pursuits. Obviously, that's incredibly important. We need to be substantively prepared, procedurally knowledgeable, intellectually savvy. But to truly be high performers and excellent at what we do, which I assume is our, our collective goal, we have to take care of our brains, our minds, our emotional health, and also our physical bodies. And if that still feels a little touchy-feely, let's talk dollars and cents. So let's consider what one of my colleagues calls the business case to promote and prioritize lawyer well-being. I'm a member of the board of the Association of American Law Schools section on balance and legal education. And a colleague on the board, Professor Jared Reich, wrote a new article called Capitalizing on Healthy Lawyers, the Business Case for Law Firms to Promote and Prioritize Lawyer Well-Being. And in that article, it's coming out in the Villanova Law Review, I, th I think either later this fall or maybe in the winter. And he makes a business case for why focusing on our employees, our junior attorneys, our staff's mental health and well-being is good for business. So if, if that resonates a little more profoundly, I highly recommend you take a look at that article, or I, I can send you the link. So to, to be consciously connected, let's take a moment to kind of check our own expectations. As, as Jennifer Ator wrote in an article in a publication called Law Practice, it really isn't acceptable or, or good for us to be on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. She says, in order to plan our lives, we must establish reasonable boundaries with our clients, our colleagues, and frankly, ourselves. We can really be high achieving and healthy. Many of us may have been going 24 seven, 52 for a long time, but as the science is showing us, it's, it's definitely affecting our productivity and our ability to solve high-level legal problems. 
Then also, let's think about ways that we can appropriately manage the expectations of others. So we discussed the rules of professional conduct earlier with the suggestion that perhaps if, if we know we need time to get back to a client with an appropriate answer, we can communicate that fact or have someone appropriate also communicate that fact to them about when we'll get back to them. Just like acknowledging someone in a store or a, a restaurant or whatever saying, I see you, I hear you, I'm going to get back to you, here's why this is gonna take a little bit of time. And then we do follow through with that proposed timeline. As Karen Hinson wrote in a general practice mentor column, time for reflection must be intentional. Even if we've been practicing law in the same industry for a really long time and, and we should know a lot about the substance and the procedure, there's still gonna be things that we need to think about more deeply and that's okay and we're servicing our client better if we say that out loud. Thomas Watson wrote in a Wisconsin Lawyer article, quote, lawyers need to educate clients about what expectation is reasonable to allow them to do the work they're retained to do. So again, we can take just a beat, a moment of pause, and explain to our clients the need to research and reflect on complex legal issues before we, we race to respond. We can encourage transparency about what is urgent and what isn't urgent. That's a tough one too. I know everything can feel urgent, but we can start to have dialogues about re what really is a court-imposed urgency or a life-or-death urgency and what isn't and can wait 12 hours or 24 hours. We could consider clarifying communications expectations and fee agreements, perhaps. We can clarify expectations about communication at night, on weekends, on vacation, making sure, of course, we have coverage for clients' matters, but also allowing us the time to have that reflection time or rest or be healthier. In, in law office environments, we could have dialogues with our junior attorneys about expectations regarding checking emails at all hours of the night. We can train legal interns and junior attorneys in how to balance all these competing needs. We have, they're gonna be balancing time pressure, the pressure to be available 24 seven, the pressure to be thorough in their research and analysis, and the reality that we really do need to think about our new generation of lawyers' ability to take care of themselves and stay in this profession for the long haul. Now this might be the toughest of all, setting healthy personal boundaries. Let's try to sleep better. So one suggestion is kind of obvious, but it's hard for a lot of us to do, is do we really need to bring our phones into our bedrooms or is it possible we could leave them in another room? And maybe you can grab it again in the morning, but just leaving it in a different room and testing out this blue light thing. Experts such as the Harvard Health Letter advise we should get off our phones at least an hour or two before we go to bed. Now, if some of you are bristling at that, I get it. Checking my phone and checking all my different emails are the, is the last thing I do every night before I go to bed and then I wonder why I'm dreaming about that faculty meeting and that document that, it, that has a typo in it and why I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming about it because I just looked at it 10 seconds before I took myself to bed. So the Harvard Health Letter advises limit screen time one to two hours before bedtime and we can use nighttime settings on our devices and computers that limit this blue light exposure. I didn't even know those existed so we can start to investigate in our screens about these nighttime settings that limit our blue light exposure if we do need to check our screens as we're winding down the day. So let's channel Madonna for a minute. I can't believe I'm saying that to lawyers. But let's channel Madonna for a minute and perhaps even consider putting our phones away during meetings and looking each other in the eye and really listening. I know that's so hard to do. We, we do a lot of our work on our screens but it might be something consider, to consider testing out if we can set our screens aside for important meetings. I miss the days of law firm life when our meetings lasted 10 minutes instead of two hour faculty meetings. So I, I hear you about the meetings. Before I started researching this myself, I used to reward myself by checking Instagram or social media once I finished two hours of writing or editing a document. But, 
Experts such as writers for Wellness Daily advise, consider not checking your phone when you're taking a break. They say that using your mobile phone while supposedly taking a break actually exacerbates our mental depletion and leads to poorer performance overall. The Texas Bar Journal article that I included in the materials for today says to limit social media to 10 minutes per platform per day. So if you've got a bunch of different platforms, that's great, but if we limit ourselves to 10 minutes per platform for, per day, we're gonna have a healthier relationship with those platforms. One thing I have done, which helps immensely, is just turning off my notifications, at least for most of the stuff on my phone. And I don't, in, in, on the East Coast, we have Amtrak with the quiet car, and it's become a kind of a joke that when you get on the quiet car, there's inevitably one person that has not turned off the ding sound on their phone, and you spend three hours between New York and DC listening to someone's notifications. What's the point of the quiet car? But for yourselves, too, it's really remarkable how many times we're distracted by our phone either dinging aloud or even vibrating. I used to have all of my notifications on vibrate. My phone was constantly vibrating all day, and every time it did, I looked at it. So now I just eliminate all my notifications except for the things that are absolutely essential. And, and for all of you, that may, perhaps that is your email, or you could consider a what the experts recommend is setting realistic, because I know you need to stay on top of things, but realistic and healthier time frames throughout the day for checking for important work emails. Other experts suggest find a consistent time and place when you make a commitment to yourself and to others to be unavailable. So law firms might consider, or law offices might consider enacting a firm-wide policy for this. Can we possibly go off-grid for at least part of our vacations? So long as we arrange for coverage for our clients and have possible exceptions for real, real emergencies. I remember back in the day, so in my career, I worked for three different law firms. I worked for a boutique litigation firm in Virginia that had 50 lawyers. I worked for a big law firm in Manhattan. And then I, my, the latter part of my practice career, I worked for a law firm with 10 lawyers. I was always, always checking email on vacations. And I remember as a junior associate, way before iPhones and smartphones were invented, I was in Mexico for the first vacation I'd taken in two years and with other people on this vacation. And I spent days trying to figure out places to buy phone cards so I could go to a payphone and call in and check my voicemail. And I did that throughout all my vacations as, as a junior associate and I really wish I hadn't. <laughs> this past summer, I spent some time in Sicily working on another writing project, actually, and this island where I was in Sicily had the worst Wi-Fi of all time. Now, the Italians thought this was amazing. You're in Sicily, it's time to unplug, you're relaxed. The Italians, I was at this very remote location on an island called Favignana. They did have a, a Wi-Fi or cell phone tower, I guess, but it was not in any of the rooms. And the Italians looked at me like I was out of my mind, that I was walking around this beautiful place trying to hold my phone in the air to get one bar of service so I could check in. And it was just a completely, completely baffling to them that I was sitting there praying to the internet gods for, for five minutes of connection so I could check in on my vacation. So ironically, we might be able to use technology to help us be better and healthier about our technology. <laughs> so apparently there is software. And it's called, um, there's a software F period L-U-X, I don't know how to pronounce it, looks like flux, but it's got a period in there, that apparently can change the color temperature of our computer display depending on the time of day. So if we do need to work on, when we do need to work on things in the evenings, it can change the color temperature of our display so we can control this blue light a bit. According to Chris Hoffman, who I mentioned earlier, looking at a warmer display at night will help reduce our eye strain and cause our brain to kick in that melatonin that we need to help us actually fall asleep when we allow ourselves to fall asleep and stay asleep and sleep better. We can also consider wearable technology or smartphone apps that remind us, hey, stop, 
take a breath, stand up, stretch, stretch our necks, recalibrate how we're sitting at our desks, or that keep track of our screen time or social media usage. So the May and June 2019 ABA Journal included an article by Patrick Pallas called Mindful Technology that made a bunch of suggestions about technologies such as, some of them are called space, forest, leaf, urban, sense a theme about nature, in moment, off the grid, app detox, insight timer is a meditation app that I try to use, headspace and calm. And there's one, this is really interesting, and that I think it's mentioned in that article, there's actually an app that you can get that will charge a dollar to your credit card every time that you exceed your own restrictions on your computer and social media or whatever you set your boundaries. If you violate your own boundaries, it will charge you money. So if that's a, you know, a way that you're motivated, that might be something to consider if this is important to you. Also on the stopping and taking a breath, I described to you earlier that when I'm working on a project, a big project, I'm usually contorted like a pretzel on my couch with my laptop propped up on the side. And I can, in my former brief writing days, I could go four or five hours at a stretch and never look up from my computer. I loved it. I, I finally understood what the, the phrase being in flow means because when I was writing a brief, I was in flow. I loved it. But I could sit there at my computer and not get up or stand up or take a sip of water or stare at something else four or five hours at a time. So in reading this research, what the experts recommend is what they call the 20-20-20 rule. If we give our eyes a break, it really goes a long way towards helping us recalibrate. Not only our eye strain, but also our physical bodies. So the 20-20-20 rule is taking a break every 20 minutes by looking at an object 20 feet away for 20 seconds. Apparently, looking into the distance allows our eyes to relax. Did anyone's eyesight change either after law school or after a couple years of practice? Yes, yes. OK, and it, it could be, according to these experts, because we spend so much time reading books, or in the, the olden days, we read books. <laughs> and now staring at our screens for so many minutes and hours in a row that we're, we're abusing our eyes. And so this 20-20-20 this 20-20-20 rule has a couple good effects. One, it helps us stop staring at our screen every 20 minutes, 20 feet away for 20 seconds. But in my mind, we can also use that 20 minute 20 minutes to me does sound pretty frequent, and it's going to be a lot for me to have to adjust to. But it's also a reminder to maybe stretch, stretch, put your shoulders back, sit up straight, stretch your neck, do whatever you need to do to become more physically comfortable, fix your posture, and also just take a moment and be conscious of how you're, you might be going down a path that's going to make you less productive instead of more productive. In the materials I provided, there's a link to a video. It's, it's very basic, but it walks you through how to do the 20-20-20 rule. On, on another note, in terms of if you're like me and you're very inappropriately using your laptop and you're contorting your body in a not so comfortable way, it might be good for us to consider how we can um, either learn more or adopt guidelines from experts on how to use our phones ergonomically and also how to set up our desks and set up our laptop usage that's more healthy. So in, in using our phones, we all see it. We see people walking around the city with their necks down like this. We're bumping into to light poles. Um, the subway system in New York, every single person has their head down facing the phone. So if we can train ourselves to hold our, I mean, if we're still going to be on our phones, but we can hold our phones up higher, it does cause more uh, strain in our arms, but at least we're you know, building our biceps by holding our phones up instead of hurting our necks inappropriately. The experts say our head should be in a neutral position and our phone should be at least at shoulder level. Same thing with um, ergonomic tips for our computer usage. Now, again, I'm not an ergonomic office expert, but the, those who are say that if we get a keyboard tray that slides out from our desk 
and they actually recommend that it slopes downward, has a negative slope. We also should have our keyboard set up so that the B or the H, or the H or the B, which I just realized are my initials actually, should, should be at our midline instead of contorted to the side like I mentioned on my couch. We, we obviously need to take frequent breaks or change our position. For many of us who speak on the phone a lot, we might consider getting a headset so we're not constantly just craning our neck against our phone and causing inadvertent strain there too. My assistant at the law school actually has a sit-stand desk, and it just rises up, and she just stands up. I walk out, she's standing up. She looks very relaxed. I should steal her desk. But we can get sit-stand desks. Some people even have treadmill desks, which, which sounds like multitasking to me. And experts also suggest replacing screen time with green time. That sounds a little cliche, but the doctors, Dr. Victoria Dunkley reports that greenery restores attention. Scientifically, this is interesting, greenery restores attention by drawing our eye and calming our nervous system simultaneously, creating a state of calm alertness, a state considered ideal for learning, that this doctor says, but for us, that could mean performing. So just by having some access to greenery can help us there. So I'm almost to the end of the prepared remarks, and I'm happy to take questions. But I came across this quote from a screen director, Guillermo del Toro, and I thought it was kind of interesting in terms of what we're talking about here today. He says, I think there's a very quiet power in things that are not on screen. So as we, we ponder these issues or kind of think about how we relate to our screens, we might give ourselves an opportunity to quiet our minds as lawyers so that the real thinking, the real lawyering, the real problem solving can get done. Because a lot of times the information, the solutions to our complex legal problems might not be embedded in our screens, in our emails, in the things we're reading, in PDFs, in PowerPoints, in contracts, in case law, in the statutes. It might be in our brains, and if we give ourselves that space to let the ideas percolate and rise to the surface, we might be more healthy, successful, and happy. So I'll leave you a few more thoughts since this is World Mental Health Day and I'm gonna take advantage of that. It absolutely does not make us weak as professionals to talk about issues of emotional, mental, and physical health and well-being in our profession. It makes us strong, it makes us stronger as a profession but also as human beings and individuals. So I, I love the concept of treating ourselves like scholar athletes, because if we think about athletes, our favorite athletes, or even our favorite performers, they obviously focus on competition and being great, and being the best, being excellent. But the best ones, if you think about your favorite athletes, or even your favorite performers, if, if you're not that into sports, our favorite athletes, our, our favorite performers, focus not, not always only on the com competitive aspect of their, their performance, they focus on their emotional well-being. Some of them have coaches to help them with their emotional well-being. A lot of them have coaches to help them on their mental well-being, how to recover from mistakes, how to recover from fear. And obviously, a lot of them have coaches on their physical well-being. Why can't we do that for us as lawyers and really be excellent at what we do not only intellectually, but emotionally, mentally, and physically. So as a side note, I work a lot, obviously, with law students, but also junior attorneys who are grappling with these issues. Because I was, I was that kid in law school. I was stressed out, I was nervous, I was scared, and then I was a stressed out, nervous, scared litigator for 20 years, quite honestly. And we ne I never talked about it. I just pretended I was fine. Because the message that I got through all those years was fake it till you make it. You know, just do it. Like put on a pair of Nikes and we can bungee jump off a cliff into Socratic bliss, right? <laughs> and nowadays we, we have a lot of messages about, about fear, you know, just face your fears. Just if you know, do something every day that scares you, like we have to get up every day and be terrified. Or, if your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough. Okay, seriously. These were the messages that, that I definitely heard and then absorbed and tried to apply 
and probably repeated to myself and to others for many years. And these are the messages that our new generation of legal professionals are also hearing. So I, I've done a lot of work on this to first of all help myself because I was a very, as I mentioned, very stressed out, anxious, nervous, fearful, law student, lawyer, and new law professor. This was 10 years ago I started teaching. And what I realized when I was teaching my first couple uh, cadres of law students was that our, my most insightful legal analysts, my, my most creative problem solvers, my most thoughtful writers, my creative problem solvers in that regard, were often my most fearful students, the ones who were most fearful of performing in class, being called on in class. They were the most scared to do performance act activities like oral arguments or mock interviews or simulated client negotiations. And so I started studying this first from the aspect of our quiet students, our quiet lawyers, introverts and in individuals who experience shyness and social anxiety, which are three totally different categories. And really trying to champion the assets that quiet individuals bring to our profession, active listening, deep thinking, creative problem solving, and thoughtful legal writing. But also because obviously we all need to be able to speak about the law with confidence and vigor and enthusiasm. Um, but some of us, you know, might not quite be ready to jump into the fray as early as, early as we are told to, especially by this increasingly fast-paced nature of our profession, I developed some tips to really help myself first, but then help our quieter law students and lawyers be able to amplify their voices authentically instead of faking it till we make it, instead of just faking confidence or jumping in or responding really quickly because that's what our expectation has become. That, that led to, I wrote a book called The Introverted Lawyer, but as I was talking with lawyers and law students and bar associations after that book came out in 2017, I kept having people come up to me afterwards and say, look, I'm, I'm really not an introvert. I don't have shyness or social anxiety. Um, I, I'm not really a shy person socially. Um, and introversion is just the way that we process energy. It has nothing to do with being shy. I kept having people come up to me and say, I'm not those categories, but I'm scared. I'm scared of making a mistake. I'm scared of not answering the senior partner's question fast enough, or if, if they're the senior partner, I'm scared of giving the wrong advice to the, the big client, or I'm scared of losing that big client if we lose a multi-million dollar case. So I kept having people come and say, look, I'm, I'm actually scared, but we don't talk about it enough in our profession. So the fear that we have of not being fast enough, which is sort of what we've been talking about today, or making a mistake is pervasive in our industry, but there's stuff that we can do about it by having conversations like what we're having about today. These, these are pressures that we all feel, but our newest generation of lawyers are feeling as well. They're also facing issues of dealing with tough personalities in our, in our high pressure profession, civility issues and all of this sort. So these conversations are so important for us to be having at this time in our profession, and I'm so thankful to this law firm for making our conversation possible today and really taking a serious look at how we can make our profession healthier and happier and more successful overall. So I'm happy to take questions. I, I hope you have a wonderful rest of today's program, and thank you very much for your attention and not being on your phones. <laughs> So I'm ha I know we have a lot of time left over, so I'm happy to take questions if people want to stand up and just ask questions, or I'm happy to stick around and answer questions individually as well, if that helps. Yes?
Absolutely. And when I was practicing in, in a really aggressive um, law firm environment, which I loved working there, it was a great environment, but I remember associates getting in trouble for putting um, out of the office email, automatic email responses, saying exactly what you were saying, that um, I'm out of the office, I'll respond, to, or I'm on vacation, I'll respond to your email later, basically. And the, the partners were upset by that. Um, and I think what could have helped in that scenario is having a dialogue within the law firm about what is, what is reasonable, what is acceptable. We don't want to put off our clients or alienate our clients or make them go somewhere else, obviously, but we do need to set some re reasonable limits for our, our law firm uh, community. And it's not that we're going to shirk our responsibilities or not follow through with the client. I think the more we can educate our law office communities, our client communities, and maybe others in different jurisdictions about what is better for us as a whole, the better we'll be. I don't, I, I have a feeling that a lot of firms, at least in the New York um, jurisdiction, even with that um, comment that a little pr seems to provide a little of leeway, I'm sure a lot of firms are still afraid to say, I'll get back to you later. I'm sure a lot of lawyers are afraid to do that too. I think it's developing a level of trust with the client that you are responsive. It's not that you're just taking the day off. It's these issues take time for us to analyze. They take time for us to research. Even if we've been working in these fields for decades, situations that we're researching are complicated and we wanna get it right. And also we do need to sleep at some point. And the more we can get um, everyone that we're working with comfortable with it's it's not just shirking off it's not making us non-responsive it's not being weak it's we want to do the best job possible so I, I don't have statistics for you but I can certainly look that up of who has best practices on how to communicate that but I think communication is the key and coming up maybe even having getting everyone in the room and having a conversation about what to say to the client having the client respond to that as well might be helpful. Yes, in the back. Well, not in the three that I worked in. <laughs> and the expectation for us, at, at least the first firm where I was a, a, a first year to sixth year associate, was be on call 24-7. But it took a toll, I, I will tell you. It, it definitely took a toll. I think it's striking the right balance especially because you know, I teach the millennial generation and Gen Z, and they have no problem telling their professor, I'm sorry, I don't check email on weekends. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, don't say that in your, in your summer associate position. So it's striking the right balance in, at least in educating, well, really educating uh, ourselves, but also the new generation of lawyers, is you want to show that you, you are available and you want to do a good job, but let's be more mindful of our profession, of the health of our profession. And I think it has to come from the top of the, these firms where, where we need to have these conversations about being available, but also making sure that we keep people around for a really long time. We want, law offices invest a lot of money in, in recruiting and training, and we can just change subtle things to make a big impact. And having conversations around these topics openly, transparently, and then testing them out. And then if it's 
not working or it's being taken advantage of, then adjust the policy. But I personally did not experience a, a law firm scenario where we had those boundaries at all. I wish I had, and, and I'd love to work on changing that. Has anyone else in the room experienced a situation where they've had these conversations and have, has a practice that works? We have a lot of work to do. <laughs> Yeah, and I, and I think with that too, at least in the firms where I worked, where those bounce back messages were not received well, which I understood from the partners, it was let's let's set some boundaries, but also explain who can handle an urgent communication in the absence of someone who really does actually deserve and need a vacation. And it's about making sure we are being realistic about what really is urgent versus what isn't, but also honoring that sometimes we just need to calm people down a little bit and have them feel heard. And it's okay to say, okay, I'm, I'm away or I'm out of the country or I'm in a place that literally has no Wi-Fi, but please feel free to contact so-and-so and they will get in touch with you and your, your questions will be answered. Anything else? I'm happy to stick around and, and answer individual questions too, if that's, that's what introverts do. <laughs> Thank you.